here, and thanks for the, to the organizers for the invitation. So I'll talk today about a little bit more about that external globus uh, pallidus that Stan uh, already mentioned a little bit. Um, in particular, I will bring a cellular perspective. I want to convince you all that one should pay attention to uh, uh, the tricks that neurons can play with their uh, internal currents um, to, uh, to be different uh, in, in different conditions. So before I start, I wanted to very briefly highlight that uh, I became a computational neuroscience actually at a very distinct point in time, which was in 1986 when I visited the second um, course in computational neuroscience in Woods Hole that was organized by Jim Bauer and Christoph Koch. Um, and that was actually the first time I, I met Upi because he was a TA in that course. He was a graduate student with Jim at the time and was busily uh, programming Genesis uh, code for reading uh, complex morphologies into uh, the simulator and also uh, doing the graphical interface. And I guess he has kept that hobby ever since and is now on the second generation of Moose programming, which is, of course, a much, much enhanced version to what we had then. Um, so the, the bug bit me at that course, and I decided to become a postdoc with Jim Bauer and, and become a modeler in my own right. Um, and I wanted to bring to your attention that uh, for anyone who is now you, uh, young, like I was at that point, and, uh, and in, in wants to be engaged in this community, now there are actually many summer courses to choose from, uh, one of which is still in Woods Hall, it turns out, but then another one is in Europe. It's called the Advanced Course in Computation Neuroscience in Europe. Uh, next year will be the 18th year. It, it's currently in, incarnation is, is taught in Poland. I'm one of the co-directors, and, and uh, I encourage students from India to uh, apply. So if, if you have questions, uh, uh, you can ask me at any, uh, any time during the pause, and I'll explain how to apply and what the general framework is. It's a four-week course, and you really become, uh, uh, you, you do your own research project, and you become a modeler in the course of that time. OK, um, so. So let's start uh, or go back to the basal ganglia, it turns out, because we already had a very nice talk on the basal ganglia. I will focus on just this one area, the external segment of the globus pallidus, and uh, really only in rodents. Um, um, and I will, so, so everyone draws their own uh, diagram of the basal ganglia in this, uh, in this field. It's customary to start with a network diagram of this type. Um, and, and you can sort of see that I put the globus pallidus right smack in the middle. It sits a, a little bit like a spider in a spider web. Um, and it has connections uh, to, to uh, multiple structures. And it gets connections from many structures. So it seems to be some sort of control center uh, of basal ganglia activity. Uh, and much of it has to do, uh, as was already mentioned, with, because the output is inhibitory. It's GABAergic uh, inhibitory output. It has to do with suppressing uh, the activity of other uh, centers. Uh, and as part of the indirect pathway, as was already mentioned, probably suppresses all those movements that we do not uh, currently want to carry out. Um, I, there are a few more pathways uh, that are interesting that we really, uh, at this point, have very incomplete understanding. So just for a short digression, for those who are actually basal ganglia experts here and, and feel that everything has been said and done in this field, it's not true. There's a lot of stuff that we do not know. Uh, just recently, uh, so this pathway, for instance, back from the globus pallidus to the stratum was known for many years uh, and sort of been dis neglected a little bit. Uh, and just recently, a new paper was published by Pete McGill in London saying that up to 25% of all GPE neurons exclusively project back to the stratum with a very, very strong inhibitory network in stratum uh, and, and even maybe doing a presynaptic uh, 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 trick on cortical afferents. So there's, there's a steady stream of new insights in the basal ganglia that we still have to absorb, uh, and there is much research still to be done. So I will not present you with a finished picture. So I will try and focus on what we have done here, which is the cellular properties uh, uh, of neurons in this structure. Our typical approach has been to uh, uh, do slice recordings, brain slice recordings from uh, rats and mice. Uh, we can fill the neurons with a dye, and then uh, we can, as I will show in a moment, reconstruct those neurons and, and, and start making computer simulations from them. A single globus pallidus neuron, or GPE neuron, is actually in the road and can span a fair amount of the total area of the globus pallidus. So it's, there's probably some sort of integration going on, even between multiple potential motor plants, even within the dendritic arbors of, of one neuron, because it actually receives input from a very wide area of straddle. Uh, outflow. Uh, it does pre present a challenge. So if you look at, uh, at the full picture, these are not so much branched. 
so they're very thin and, and pretty much unbranched dendrites that extend for very long distances. And one of the questions would be, and I will address it uh, later on, is just how could input on the outer sides even make it to the soma? Uh, and, and signal uh, transmission through very thin dendrites is actually attenuated severely, and that would be one question is, what kind of active tricks might a neuron have in order to actually be able to uh, pay attention to stuff that happens out there? So we build a, a model by uh, simplifying the soma into a sphere and, and basically having a 3D reconstruction with software. Usually we use Neurolucida to uh, draw under the microscope um, the exact shape and put it into a computer file. Um, just based on first principles, uh, because these dendrites are studded with synapses and uh, people like Yolan Smith have counted synapses uh, and, and the density of synapses, we know that uh, uh, just on a very rough approximation, for good enough for a modeler probably, um, we have on the order of maybe 1,200 excitatory synapses and about five times as many inhibitory synapses on this neuron. So this is also an interesting aspect in the sense that it's really dominated by inhibitory inputs, and yet if you record from uh, living animals, it's one of the fastest firing uh, uh, structures in the brain. So it often uh, goes ticking at 80 hertz, 80 spikes per second in the primate, uh, about 30-some spikes per second in the, in the rodent in vivo. And yet uh, the majority of inputs are inhibitory. So there, there's probably some uh, powerful ways to, uh, to keep activation and spiking going. Uh, on the other hand, the excitatory inputs are actually uh, uh, active at a much higher frequency than the inhibitory ones. So if you just look at number of expected inputs per second, uh, it's, more, it's, it's quite a few more actually excitatory ones than inhibitory ones, and that may explain actually a, a large part of that mystery. But we'll come back to uh, the question of how inhibition excitation can control uh, activity. Now this is slice recording. Uh, if you just put uh, a, a, a brain slice uh, in a dish and you block synaptic activity and you do a whole cell recording from a GP neuron in the slice, you will find that it is a regular pacemaker. It's a little bit like a clock that goes on the order of 10 spikes per second uh, and it keeps going without any synaptic input. Very small steering forces, so picoamps is a small current and if you have just 40 picoamps you can already shut down this neuron very easily and with just positive 40 picoamps you can make it speed up several times. So very small control forces uh, can, can create large changes in spike rate. Uh, and it is set at a steady click uh, all by itself. Now, I'm not going to show you all the conductances, exactly how they interact to create this pattern. But let's just say that one particular conductance uh, is important for the regularity of this firing. That is called the uh, calcium-dependent SK uh, conductance, uh, which is not a voltage-gated current, but one that needs the inflow of calcium into the neuron, and then the calcium comes in with every spike, and then in response to each spike, we get a little bit of a potassium current activated by that calcium, and that spaces what we call the medium AHP, these rounded waveforms that sort of space the spikes regularly uh, across, uh, dependent on this current. You block this current, and you get a much more irregular firing, much more bursty uh, type of neuron. This is just, uh, and I'm not going to talk much about this current in this talk. In fact, uh, Charlie Wilson had, uh, has written a couple of papers just on how th that impacts uh, spiking patterns of GP neurons, uh, and you could read those. This is just to say that the individual components and membrane currents in the neuron are extremely important to control both the spontaneous spike pattern and the also responses to synaptic input uh, that this neuron may show. So we make a computer simulation of these neurons. Uh, uh, for those of you who have not done compartmental models, I want to just use two slides to sort of show how they work. A compartmental model is a model where we break the neuron into distinct little pieces that are called compartments. Each of this compartment is what we call isopotential. It has one variable for voltage. Uh, and so it's basically discretization of voltage in space uh, uh, through these compartments. We have uh, an electrical equivalent circuit that basically, as, as in terms of almost electrical engineering, describes how currents flow uh, both across the membrane and along the cylinders, which is called the internal or axial resistance and axial current. Um, and each type of ion channel is a parallel channel of uh, potential ions flowing across the membrane and is governed by a set of what we call Hodgkin-Huxley equations for voltage-gated currents that basically is a, is 
set of rules that describe how voltage determines the opening and closing of these ion channels uh, over time. We have synaptic channels that can be opened and closed by transmitters, and we have what is just called the leak, or those channels that are always open that determine the resting membrane potential. So we simulate these numerically. We still use the software Genesis, uh, although uh, Moose would be certainly doing just a fine job as well as Neuron and other simulators can handle this kind of standard simulation just fine. And you do not actually have to uh, know uh, differential equation solvers personally that well to start being a, a modeler at this level. So when we uh, put these together, we first have to quantify basically the voltage dependence of the different channels. Uh, that actually is, uh, takes a lot of work to do uh, what is called voltage clamp recordings and isolating individual channel types and their kinetics. Uh, typically, my lab relies on other people's work for this, and we just really read the literature as carefully as we can and create basically the voltage-dependent gates for these channels and quantify them in Hodgkin-Huxley equations. And then, uh, we, uh, as I will show in a moment, we have actually nine different kind of uh, membrane uh, conductances in this model that are all based on experimental evidence. Then we still have to tune uh, how much of each conductance we need. Uh, the traditional method for this is called hand tuning. So we will uh, just uh, up and down regulate each uh, kind of conductance across the membrane. And we have a target, which is basically a recording, which shows us the spontaneous firing. At, at you, we use the spike shape as part of our target function. And the amount of increase and decrease of firing with current injection and slices is part of our target. And we basically just twiddle with these conductances for several months uh, uh, until we uh, reach a model state that uh, at first glance, looks very similar to uh, the, uh, the original recording. And then, of course, uh, you try to publish this, and there will be many questions from the referees. Uh, um, and that kind of uh, hand-tuning approach has led to many questions that are actually quite valid and important, one of which is, is just, is this an arbitrary solution? How many uh, types of models could do this? Uh, um, uh, and, and so on. And we have, along with others, uh, then uh, resorted to a, a database uh, strategy where we actually will, uh, uh, so these are our nine conductances, uh, one of which is just calcium gated, the other ones are voltage gated. Um, I will not go over the detailed kinetics for each conductance. They each have their own individual contribution to membrane dynamics and also synaptic coding. We just then uh, randomly assign a, a, a each of these conductances to one of three values in our study, which overall actually has 98,000 permutations of these uh, values. And we run each and every one of those 98,000 simulations. And then we can just basically say, well, how many of the models with this complete uh, uh, random uh, approach of combinations of uh, conductance density parameters uh, will uh, create a useful output? Uh, and are there just a few uh, solutions? Are there many solutions? And so on. So we can. Uh, basically analyze model robustness and sensi parameter sensitivity with this brute, what we call a brute force uh, search approach. Um, so the out outcome of that uh, is, is what, and I don't have time to, uh, so there's a whole neuro journal of neuroscience paper that you're certainly welcome to look up um, uh, that describes many more details. But what I want to just tell, tell you here is that, first of all, if you have biological recordings, and these are something like 130 recordings from brain slices of GP neurons, and we are just basically showing histograms of different uh, what we call behaviors that are really just performance measures of these neurons, uh, something like spontaneous uh, spike rate or the amplitude of the action potential or the width at half maximum or the spike frequency adaptation, which is how much the spiking gets slower and faster during a sustained input. The SAG, which is a measure of uh, when you hyperpolarize a neuron of just how much the membrane potential uh, relaxes back uh, from its maximum. And a rebound ratio, which is just how much after hyperpolarization spiking is sped up compared to control. Um, so these are just a set of uh, benchmark measurements of uh, neural dyna dynamics. And first we see that Biological neurons do not have a fine-tuned optimal solution to this, and I think it's important, and Stan already mentioned that variability in this spinal network is, is not just a, a, a flaw of biology, it's actually important for, uh, for computation, and uh, there are several folks now doing network simulations of cortical structures, and they, I think, in each instance find that variability is actually an important feature of neural computation. It's not just because we're unable to maintain tight, uh, tight parameters. Um, 
And this variability is, uh, is reproduced by our simulation space, which uh, in, 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 in reasonable, actually, uh, shape. So if you look at these distributions, they match the distributions on the top to some degree. And we, we never intended them to match. We didn't optimize our parameter space in any way to optimize these matches. Uh, all we did is a random selection of, of combinations of these uh, uh, densities and plotted the 98,000 simulations that came out. So in a way, what this shows is that the biological variability could be just a random combination of conductance densities of, of these various conductances. And that explains a, a large amount of, of the variability that you see. And furthermore, that that variability could be on the order of uh, two to four fold is actually uh, what Eve Marder would tell you she has found in invertebrate uh, uh, neurons, is that if you do a quantitative assessment of currents in copies, and in the invertebrate world, they have the advantage that uh, they can find the exact same neuron in each critter, so they can say this is the identical neuron in animal one, two, and three, and you then say, well, how much sodium current, how much potassium current, how much I IH does this neuron have? And it may vary on the, uh, on the factor two to four. And uh, if we do the same thing then in the mammal, we find that the resulting variability matches uh, in a first approximation the biological variability. So this is probably the amount of sloppiness that, uh, that exists. And I want to put to rest those uh, uh, reviewers that then say, well, your model isn't the perfect one. Your model isn't optimal. We don't need an optimal model. We just need to actually uh, match a very messy and variable biological situation. And we need to sit somewhere in that same parameter space. And we have a model that works and, and re replicates maybe one out of those million biological neurons relatively exactly, and the other ones within a certain uh, variability. So we're not trying to do perfect models. We're doing uh, what I would call sort of the working hypothesis model that does a good job as far as we can uh, measure it. So then uh, we, uh, we use our model for various uh, studies of synaptic integration. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. Um, the first uh, study was done by Nathan Schulteis, who did a PhD in my lab on phase response curve analysis uh, in the model. I will very briefly explain what a phase response curve is and then how uh, we found that in the globus pallidus there are some interesting features to this particular analysis and function. So a phase response curve, uh, and for some of you this is an old hat, for some of you it might be uh, interesting and surprising. Um, the phase response curve is determined the following way experimentally. You basically, you disturb this, this, first of all, you have to have an oscillating background. You have to have a spontaneous pacemaking background that has a certain uh, spacing between action potentials. That's called the phase. Uh, uh, between, so the phase uh, uh, 360 degrees would be a certain number of milliseconds. And it would be predictable uh, just when that next spike would occur on the on spike cycle. You make a small disturbance. In this case, it's a very brief corn injection, a positive corn injection. And uh, that brief disturbance leads to a shift in the next spike timing, which is what we believe synaptic input ultimately does. It shifts spike times around. Um, and this being an excitatory input actually left, left uh, the next spike come a little earlier. Now, the interesting part is that then on the phase response curve, if you disturb the activity cycle roughly halfway, you may get a phase advance of about uh, five degrees of the next spike. If you disturb the spike cycle at a slightly different place, you may actually see a much different shift in spike timing. In this case, it got much bigger. Uh, so we had a much bigger effect on the spike cycle when we stimulated here than when we stimulated here. And this is shown by the red bar. So this is a much bigger phase advance of the spike cycle. What this basically tells you is that synaptic input is dependent on what time in the spike cycle it occurs. And that actually tends to be a, an important aspect of uh, things like neural synchronization and oscillations, that, uh, that inputs depends and has different effects based on where in the spike cycle it occurs. Uh, we just here plot a third input to show that, uh, it's, it's, that it, this function has a peak and that if you get even closer to the spike, you get uh, less delay again. And if you actually have an input very early in the spike cycle, like here, in this particular curve, you would have almost no effect at all. Now, there is a theoretical finding and there are also experiments that show that some neurons have the kind of phase response curve that I just showed you. It's, it's just got one positive peak for excitation, meaning that for all inputs during the spike cycle, we would make the next spike occur earlier. That's called a type 1 phase response curve. 
Then there are other neurons that have an interesting feature which is called a type 2 phase response curve. And just if you use excitatory input, that is a depolarizing coronary ejection or synapse, if you apply it late in the spike cycle, you get the spike to advance, occur earlier, like you expect for an excitatory input. However, if you put the same excitatory input early in the phase for about the first half of the spike cycle, it will actually delay the next spike. So paradoxically, your excitatory input will actually have an inhibitory uh, uh, net effect. It will delay the next spike and instead of advancing it. So these biphasic phase response curves are called type 2. Uh, for those of you who want to reduce systems and understand the mathematics of this, you can actually do this with uh, three parameter simulations of, Hodgkin, uh, of reduced Hodgkin Huxley equations. You can uh, get both types uh, with very simple bifurcation dynamics. So it can be analyzed mathematically in much detail. Um, we tried to figure out well, what does the globus pallidus neuron do in terms of phase response space? We uh, actually stimulated or nascent stimulated uh, with synaptic input uh, various parts of the dendrite and the soma to see how much and where it would shift spikes around. And what was, I think, a new finding uh, and, 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 and generated a, a, a paper in Journal of Neuroscience is that uh, the kind of phase response curve that you see is location dependent. So for an uh, input to the soma, uh, this would be an AMPA type a synaptic input, an excitatory input. You would see, uh, uh, for in excitation, you see a phase advance. For inhibition, you see a phase delay. This is a classic type 1 phase response curve. However, if you put the same synapses, the same AMPA synapses on a distal dendrite, you actually find that it uh, is converts into a type 2 phase response curve. So phase response curves then are, are location specific, and that was a new result. Uh, and that would mean that excitation to a distal part of the dendrite could have a completely different effect on things like network synchronization uh, between uh, parallel neurons than, uh, than input on the proximal uh, part. And if one tries to do, do reduced network simulations, one would want to keep those factors in mind and, and adjust uh, those simulations to reflect these aspects. Now, how did this... So the model, obviously, you should be able to understand why this is happening. And this is one of the good ways uh, to use models, is to, to delve into, into the mechanistic underpinnings, the conductances that cause these effects. This was an, uh, is, is a relatively easy effect to understand in this model. So this is our phase response curve for a, a synaptic excitation in the distal uh, dendrite. And then if you, uh, you block or up or down regulate the SK current in the dendrite, you can uh, create uh, various amounts of the type 2 character. And if you entirely block the SK current, and this is just local to the stimulus, so if you just take away the SK current from this part of the dendrite, you actually convert this into a type uh, 1 phase response curve. So in this case, basically, the SK conductance, and it also requires the uh, high voltage gated calcium current as an inflow of calcium uh, to trigger the SK conductance. So it's the local depolarization of the stimulus that results in a calcium inflow and then an activation of the potassium current that ultimately delays the spike. Um, and it turns out that the steering current, the current that I put in as, an, as a synapse or as a current injection is much smaller than the secondary current that I trigger through the calcium inflow. And this is how I can have a net inhibitory effect from an excitatory input in this neuron. So th that's, uh, that's the mechanistics of that. And I will, uh, we, we wrote a second paper about how this may all uh, in impact in vivo patterns and, and complex synaptic inputs that I don't have time to uh, talk about. So I want to go on to the next story, which uh, was uh, actually done over several years in the lab and started with work by a graduate student, Jesse Hansen. Um, who worked together with myself and, and Jolan Smith at Emory University and uh, was interested, uh, we were interested in just how distal dendrites could potentially even make uh, their effect known at the soma. We thought we need some sort of amplification of signals on the way. Uh, one natural way to amplify signals is with uh, inward currents in the dendrites, currents that can prolong and increase depolarization. 
Uh, in an extreme case, uh, you can actually create dendritic action potentials with uh, sodium uh, cons. That was already known to be the case in mitral cells that, for instance, UPI works on in the olfactory bulb. That's known for quite a while. To, and then in pyramidal neurons, it is also actually under debate whether forward propagating action potentials occur, but certainly backward propagating action potentials occur in dendrites. So uh, for those of you who sort of just have a classic uh, introductory neurobiology, the soma is supposed to have action potentials and the dendrite is supposed to listen to inputs. Well, in real dendrites, some neurons actually have action potentials in the dendrites. And uh, we wanted to A, know whether this may happen in GP, and B, if it does happen, what consequences would it have on computation? And we, again, resort to a mix of uh, physiology and, uh, and computational approaches. So the physiology is shown here in just one slide from this paper that if we record from the soma and we basically uh, put a fluorescent dye in the soma so that we can see the dendrites after 10 minutes in the slice, and we can just snuggle up to a dendrite here, very, very close, just a few microns away, and we can either puff glutamate here or we can electrically stimulate uh, the local uh, inputs. We can, uh, and we put this actually in voltage clamp, so we don't actually let the neuron depolarize to threshold. We keep it away from threshold, hyperpolarized. Then we see actually that our synaptic stimulation here leads to an arriving action current at the soma uh, uh, at a certain uh, threshold. And if we hyperpolarize even more to a very negative potential, minus 100, we basically see no synaptic current uh, reach at all. So it is, this is positive evidence for the induction of dendritic sodium action potentials that then run into the voltage clamp at the level of the soma and generate an action current uh, there. So uh, there is, and this doesn't happen in all dendrites or all neurons, so there seems to be a mix of GP neurons that can or cannot uh, have strong enough local currents um, to uh, trigger action potentials. And Jesse Hansen also worked with uh, sodium channel antibodies in Jolan Smith's lab, which is an EM lab, and, and he found uh, evidence for uh, antibody binding of three distinct uh, subunits of voltage-gated sodium channels in the dendrites of GP neurons. So then uh, Jeremy Edgerton, who's a postdoc, or was a postdoc in the lab, uh, um, did a modeling study, so he used the same GP model. Um, by the way, that model is available uh, on, uh, on neural, NeuronDB uh, uh, at Yale, so if anyone wants to download and, and play with this model, uh, it's, been, it's publicly available. You can, uh, you'd want to run Genesis unless you want to translate it to Neuron yourself, uh, uh, and you can start playing with this Neuron tomorrow if you want to. Um, so what Jeremy did is he uh, created a, a family of models that had a different amount of dendritic sodium channels. Um, uh, so the uniform model had the most dendritic sodium channels. In fact, they were uniformly distributed throughout the soma and the dendrites. And then he created various gradient models where the steepest gradient basically had almost no dendritic sodium channels and, and had a very rapid transition from the soma into the proximal dendrite to no sodium channel density in, uh, in the distal dendrites. He verified that uh, uh, back-propagating action potentials were fully present in the uniform case and that we basically had just passive, uh, highly attenuating propagation of at action potentials in the uh, uh, models that had a steep gradient of sodium current. Um, now, are these then completely differently behaving models? Uh, 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 and and would, this be, would both of these models be compatible with the kind of recordings we'd obtain in slices? And the answer is yes. So if you simulate uh, a neuron with, uh, with low or high sodium current in the dendrites, you actually can uh, tune them very easily to both have the same spontaneous spiking frequency and both have a very similar FI curve, meaning if you just inject current in the soma, they speed up or slow down the same amount. So from the point of view of a somatic recording, they behave uh, identically almost, except that you see that they, these guys have a more rounded uh, uh, after hyperpolarization, and these guys have a more uh, sawtooth kind of after hyperpolarization with the highest sodium concentrations. And also the one with the lowest sodium concentrations tend to end in depolarization block more easily uh, when you try to depolarize them strongly. And if you look at our slice recordings, uh, and this is just parallel universe. We can't prove it's due to dendritic sodium cons because we have no independent measure of those in our slice recordings. But our slice recordings show some neurons have this rounded uh, shape to the AHPs. Some other neurons have this 
sawtooth shape to their, uh, to their uh, uh, IHPs, and we also have a large amount of variability of how much corn they can take before they end up in a depolarization block. So there seems to be a parallel universe uh, in our slice recordings to uh, the potential uh, amount of dendritic sodium corn. So then uh, we wanted to know, well, what is the uh, consequence for dendritic sodium corns on synaptic integration and potential network function? And we then uh, basically put uh, in vivo-like input patterns onto these neurons uh, in the model and, and sort of wanted to see, well, what is controlling spiking and what does the outcoming spike pattern look like in these uh, different models? Now, if we have uh, almost only sodium corn in the soma and none in the, uh, in, the, in the dendrites, then all spiking is actually triggered in the axon hillock. And it turns out that you get a fast and regular firing neuron even if the inputs are equally, they are Passoin distributed random inputs, and we have 485, I believe, synapses uh, in, uh, along the entire neuron, uh, and we get this fast firing regular. The autocorrelation here shows side peaks, which means that each spike occurs at a regular interval to the next one, which gives you these, what we call a side peak, and an autocorrelation tells you it's a regular firing neuron. If you have a uniform dendritic sodium current, you actually get uh, equally fast firing. In fact, we will show a faster firing firing, but you get a much more irregular spiking, and you don't get the side peaks in the autocorrelation, so you're going to deregularize the firing. Now, what about synapses that actually cause the spikes in the different models? And this is an interesting shift. So for the neuron that, uh, that is, has only somatic and axonal sodium channels, Maybe to no surprise, and, and in green are now synapses that are effective in causing spikes, and in blue are synapses that are not effective in causing spikes. Um, what you see is that the only effective synapses are those close to the soma, because they will create big EPSPs in the soma, uh, and, and therefore they can uh, induce spikes. So this is what we would call a, a general summation device. So all the cons are summated and, and increase spike firing frequency in the soma, the inputs close to the soma are the ones that work. Uh, now, the dendritic spiking model actually is the total opposite. The, the synapses that are effective are the ones on the most distal ends on the, on the dendrites, uh, because they are actually sitting at what we call a high input resistance side of the neuron. They will trigger the biggest uh, uh, EPSPs in the, in the whole neuron, and the biggest EPSPs will, thresh, uh, will cross threshold for action potentials. And then these guys are privileged in, in triggering local action potentials in dendrites. So uh, now you have the opposite. And you would actually have to have some homeostatic plasticity mechanism to try and regula regulate uh, the, what we call a democratic model that would uh, have just amount, the right amount of sodium corn to give about equal weight to uh, each synapse. So. Um, and I just very briefly want to show, uh, there's a, a little video of uh, basically this is the firing of the model uh, with all axonals. So the inputs are measured. This is just a local measurement of, uh, of voltage in the different dendrites. This is uh, the somatic channel where the action potentials are initiated. And you see a very regular firing pattern and basically just a twinkling of depolarization throughout the dendrite that gets integrated here and sums up to um, the action potential. Now we have the uh, dendritic spiking model. And you see that it looks completely different in the sense that uh, you basically have uh, hyperpolarization. And then uh, there is a local uh, set of inputs that exceed threshold. It will be a firing. And then the firing first forward propagates and then backward propagates through all the other dendrites. And you have these very distinct locally triggered uh, events. Uh, and you see now spikes uh, throughout the neuron. Now this type of neuron, then, is really a, a coincidence detector. It, it, it spikes in reaction to local coincidences in, in, in specific dendrites, which is a very different computational function from summation. Uh, how, how that plays a role in, we have not done network simulations, so I cannot tell you how that would uh, actually change things like action selection, uh, but it's certainly worth uh, thinking about. Uh, we did a brief study on. Um, just how this may involve uh, Parkinsonian activity patterns. Um, so in Parkinson's disease, the globus pallidus changes activity patterns from basically a highly uncorrelated firing. Uh, usually it's irregular, and some cells are more regular. But if you look at two neurons recorded at any distance from each other, their spike timing is not related to each other. That's called decorrelation. Uh, um, 
in Parkinson's disease, uh, then actually globus pallidus neurons and other parts of the basal ganglia start to be what we call hypersynchronized. Uh, and we see uh, these cross correlations where uh, the, the spikes of the different neurons are highly correlated in time. And this is actually some sort of pathological synchronization that may be underlying a fair amount of the disease problems. And uh, treatments such as deep brain stimulation may actually break up the synchronization more than doing anything else. And that seems to be beneficial. So uh, we were just interested in how those sodium channels may or may not contribute to synchronization or the lack thereof. Uh, and we got data from Pete McGill uh, in Oxford, who gave us his uh, subthalamic nucleus uh, activity patterns from uh, 6-adoxin dopamine lesion rats that show this rhythmic bursting pattern. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we post-processed uh, those uh, spike trains to create 800 inputs to our globus pallidus neuron model that were then beta band modulated synchronized input trains. Um, since I'm running low on time, I'm going a little faster, but it's a beta modulated um, synchronized input pattern to our globus pallidus neuron. And then we uh, put that Parkinsonian input pattern uh, to either the sodium, uh, dendritic sodium spiking or the non-dendritic sodium spiking model. And we found, actually, that the dendritic sodium spiking model, and this was a surprise, it was the opposite from what I expected, it turns out. Um, and this is where modeling actually sometimes guides your intuition and does not do what you expect it would do. But the one with the high dendritic sodium cons actually led to less permeation of oscillations. And the one with low dendritic and all axonal spiking actually amplified or, or let oscillations uh, through more easily. Uh, so it is conceivable that a shift in uh, sodium channel densities with Parkinson's disease, and uh, a lot of these conductances are dependent on modulatory state uh, and homeostatic re regulation. So it's very feasible that these parameters shift in Parkinson's disease. Um, so a prediction could be that uh, a shift towards less uh, dendritic sodium spiking would uh, leave you to uh, more oscillation synchronization in the basal ganglia. Um, in the last two minutes, uh, just as a sort of that we're moving on, so in fact, we are currently no longer working on globus pallidus neurons very much in the lab. We have moved on to the thalamus. Uh, together with some other folks at Emory, we have a Udall's uh, Parkinson's Disease Center grant. And we are now looking at uh, the thalamus, mostly the motor thalamus. So we are, we are moving on to the output of the basal ganglia to the motor thalamus, VM, in the, in the mouse, and trying to figure out how basal ganglia outflow uh, directs uh, spiking patterns uh, in, in the thalamus, which then would ultimately affect spiking patterns in the cerebral cortex. Um, just as a little uh, introductory story, um, another uh, interesting model ar uh, organism for basal ganglia function has been the songbird and the learning circuit, the song learning circuit in songbirds. And uh, David Perkel, who was actually a fellow postdoc uh, in, at Caltech when Upi and I were there, so we know him well from then. Uh, but he is studying bird brains and found out that the basal ganglia analog of the bird brain area X can cause in the bird brain analog of the thalamus, uh, DLM, can cause what we call rebound spike bursts. That is, a strong inhibition can actually hyperporize the cell so as to deinactivate some cons that then cause a burst pattern. And this is actually uh, known from the mammalian thalamus for many years that we have these what we call T-type bursting uh, performances. If you hyperporize a thalamic neuron and you let go of the hyperporization, you'll have this T-type calcium channel dependent rapid burst. Uh, this is a recording that we did in slices from VM thalamus and mice. Uh, then we used optogenetics to uh, add inhibition from basal ganglia output. So we transfected uh, the substantia nigra reticulata in, in, in mice with channel rhodopsin. And then we can record in the uh, thalamus and, and, and just optically stimulate just the inhibitor inputs from the substantia nigra. We get nice IPS uh, piece. And we can then ask the question of those are suitable or not suitable to uh, create rebound bursts. Uh, the maybe Surprising answer is, and again, it's maybe not what would be the, the nicest story to get, uh, but the, the answer is that mostly it does not generate rebound bursts. Uh, and mostly we get classical inhibition, so there's no spike bursts after these IPSPs. And then when we, when we drive the cell to a, a spontaneous spiking, the IPSPs do what they're supposed to do, is basically uh, lead to short interruptions of spike timing. 
So we can actually find only in very narrow parameter regimes. And so if we tweak it just right and give little bursts of optical pulses and you know, adjust at the right membrane potential, then once in a while we can actually get rebound bursts. But again, in the upstates, they just turn into pauses. But the parameter regime for rebounds is extremely narrow. Uh, and, and in our hands would not really be the one we expect to operate in vivo very reliably. So we, we're back to the more classic uh, inhibitory model of basal ganglia function. So as conclusions, globus pallidus single cell models can replicate brain slice data variability uh, through random conductance densities. That was the brute force database studies of Genghis Gunai and Jeremy. The synaptic input output function is likely location dependent. So where you stimulate the dendrite is important for what it does to network properties. And specifically, excitatory input to the distal dendrite gives you type 2 phase response curves. Physiological recordings indicate that the uh, GP neurons are capable of dendritic sodium spike initiation. And in a model, such spiking has important consequences for synaptic integration. And um, uh, we basically switch the neuron from being a summator to a coincidence detector with dendritic sodium spikes. Parkinsonian synchronization is reduced in the presence of dendritic sodium spike initiation. And integration of basal ganglia input in motor thalamus most likely reflects the traditional model of hyperporizing inhibition rather than rebound spiking. And for the very last slide, I want to show the folks who did the work. Uh, Jeremy Atkerton has been a postdoc for several years. Jesse Hansen did the original work on sodium channels. Eric Hendrickson's work I didn't get to talk about. Uh, Genghis uh, Gunai did the database, and he's here with Nation Schulteis, who uh, did the phase response course. And that's just uh, one of the parties in my house that uh, happen when there are birthdays and other things. So thanks a lot for your attention. So the question is about GPE. It receives massive inhibition from striatum. And uh, yes, I agree that uh, SDN inputs are excitatory, so it makes sense to talk about uh, what will happen to the PRCs. But in connection to these uh, uh, excitatory inhibitory inputs, how do you think these PRCs are going to tell us something about oscillations? or how they change, actually, when you get excitatory inhibitory current simultaneously. OK, so this is the we, we did do a follow-up on the study I showed, where we did put a background. And in fact, the, it is a good question. How, how do phase response curves even matter when there isn't an oscillatory background, but a random stochastic background steered by many, many uh, uh, inputs? And it turned out that the average uh, behavior of the response was still the same. So if you did a couple of hundred stimulations, you would still, on average, see the same shift in spike times uh, that was phase dependent of the input. Uh, so so it, it's on a, in an average sense, it still works. In individual stimulation, uh, it depends very much on what the uh, random inputs are at that point in time. Uh, now, inhibition uh, would, uh, we, we did not do phase response course for inhibition uh, per se, but it, the inhibition would just create the noisy background that would uh, basically take away from the reliability of, of these phase responses. There's, there's room for many more studies. Just uh, did one short one. Uh, P PRC is actually a property of the spiking mechanism. And uh, now these distal inputs are affecting the PRC. Does it mean that the model, sh we should think of, like, we should discard the point model? or? Uh, uh, I mean, why, the, why is it actually happening that distal inputs are changing PRCs? Is it the input that, has, that is coming has changed? Well, so PRC, so one has to delve deeply into uh, the theory of PRCs and, and whether it is or isn't valid for biological neurons. Uh, usually we think about weak uh, inputs, uh, inputs that do not depolarize the neuron enough to actually uh, uh, activate voltage-gated conductances. And only then is it the spike initiation mechanism that determines the PRC. If you start uh, depolarizing or hyperpolarizing the neuron enough to activate and inactivate other conductances in the membrane, then they also play an important role. And it turns out that, I mean, I'm sort of the realist uh, that, that tries to see what really happens in biological neurons. And, and most inputs are big enough to significantly uh, interact with uh, all kinds of voltage-dependent mechanisms in the membrane. And it isn't just uh, the pure uh, PRCs uh, that are the, weekly, uh, the weak input. And then the theory has a hard time uh, being, uh, being fully predictive of what would happen in networks. That, that is also true. So we cannot uh, now hand this over to a theorist to say what happens with networks. You 
probably have to simulate it. Okay, okay. very nice talk. Two questions. First, do you know the distribution of KCA channels along the dendrites? I mean, some neurons have rather little, most of the KCAs on proximal dendrites and little on distal dendrites. Yeah, so we do not know the accurate distribution. Uh, so we don't have antibodies, so we have certainly not use them if they exist, um, so, so we're not sure. It has been a little bit has been done on calcium corns, and, and, uh, and, and you also need the calcium inflow, obviously, to, to trigger SK, so, and, and the calcium corn is appropriately located in the, in the dendrites. And, and secondly, uh, you mentioned in, in passing Pete McGill's new findings right. of, of, of two types of, of neurons, and they are one is feeding back very much to to straighten, but the input is rather uh, is not well known, except that they are alternating with the sort of GPE right, right. STN projections. Do you know if uh, and they have different morphology also? Do you know if your cells are primarily the STN projecting or no? We do not know that. So and the morphology is, is different if you already know which one they're belonging to, but they're widely overlapping. So you, you cannot okay. by just looking at the shape say they're this or the other type. Okay. So okay. they're only sort of statistically significant small difference in morphology. It's not like they're really looking different at first sight. Okay. Um, so yes. no, we don't know is the answer. So and it could be that one of them is more sodium spike prone than the other. It's it's entirely possible. But uh, we wouldn't, no, we would not know at this point. So you showed that um, small perturbations, 40 picoweights or so, can change both the rate and the phase of the output. And it's also location dependent. And so I was just think, wondering, you know, this level of input just represents a few synapses out of the thousands that are there. It could represent just a few synapses. Yeah, so I think that. Given that synapses can be plastic, question is, what maintains a set point? I mean, you could easily imagine that this whole system becomes extremely wandering out in nonlinear space. Is there kind of a global minimum, and how do you maintain that? Well, these are all good questions, and the answer is, is usually that we don't know enough yet about the system. Uh, so we believe, and I think the whole field uh, is studying, uh, not just in, in the basal ganglia, but in the whole brain, is studying homeostatic plasticity mechanisms uh, quite a bit. And Gina Turnjana gave a nice talk at SFN, just as the tip of the iceberg, that, uh, that just about every synaptic input uh, strength and, and every conductance we know of undergoes some sort of activity-dependent regulation to keep it within its parameter range to not make the neuron be excited too much or too little. So we obviously, I think that that happens in the glows pallidus as well, but we have not studied that, and it's actually, uh, that would be a lot of studies to s try and figure out exactly how many homeostatic regulatory mechanisms there are and what they do. Uh, and the other hidden, uh, and, and you're sort of, you're absolutely right that in, in, in terms of really understanding basal ganglia function, we would want to know the status of all synapses and how many of them are strong and how many of them are weak and, 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 and uh, what learning uh, does to the population of inputs and, and how many of them are now contributing, how many of them are not contributing so much. So we, I, I totally agree that this, the long-term synaptic plasticity is where these uh, networks get trained uh, and, 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 and where certain uh, ensembles can be established as important and, and representing a certain behavior. And uh, while we know that there's long-term potentiation and depression in, in all of these uh, circuits, we really don't know how they're related to motor learning at this point. So I think we're sort of slowly coming from the input side. In the stratum, the ideas are a little more clear, and the plasticity mechanisms have been studied a little better, and we have some ideas and models how that impacts learning. And when it comes to plasticity mechanisms in the globus pallidus and how they contribute to learning, uh, I think everybody's ideas are quite vague at this point. But I, I think the answer is that they will uh, be important. OK, so uh, we'll have one more question and then uh, have a tea break now. And it'll be a short tea break to try and catch up. Um, so I'd like, so one more question, and then maybe we can reconvene at uh, uh, 11.25. OK, so there was one more question, and then tea break. <laughs>
Thank you, sir, for the talk. Uh, actually, you were mentioning that the beta oscillations come when the sodium densities and all go down. But also, uh, when there are more lateral connections in STN, you get a beta oscillation. So which is actually initiating it? Is it from the GPE or? I, I, I get all those questions that I have no answers for. So, uh, so the, 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 the triggering of beta oscillations in Parkinson's disease is under intense study. Uh, and, and, and there are many people who have favorite ideas. Um, so one favorite idea is that there's a core oscillatory mechanism between globus pallus and STN, and it re requires really the feedback network. You couldn't say it's one or the other. It's the feedback connections that cause the beta in that model. And it was popularized originally by Dietmar Plenz, even before we knew about it happening in Parkinson's disease, because in co-cultures of STN and GP neurons, you can get these ping-pong effect of oscillations. But then there are folks like very serious mathematicians like Nancy Coppell who would uh, blandly put it in the stratum as, as the cause, uh, as the ultimate uh, beta oscillatory mechanism. She has very specific GABA, uh, GABA uh, synapse time constants in mind for causing beta oscillations. So, so there's at least a straddle and a GPSTN uh, view of what causes them. Um, I once saw a very interesting talk from a physicist who just tried to decompose the multiple sources of oscillations in, in brain networks with multi-unit recordings in awake animals. And he came through some mathematical analysis, I don't remember, to uh, the po possibility of several hundred oscillators in the brain. So uh, there, there are many, many uh, uh, mechanisms that can cause oscillations. And I think there's another uh, likely source in cortex itself uh, for, for beta as well. And, uh, it's been shown that subthalamic nucleus is influenced strongly by, by cortex uh, in its activity, and maybe some of the oscillatory patterns actually come from cortex. And it's not mutually exclusive. You can actually have multiple uh, uh, pattern generators, and they can uh, become synchronized and, and re reinforcing, or they can uh, not become that way uh, in, in certain conditions. So I don't even think it's necessary that there has to be one source of beta oscillations. But I don't have a personal favorite. I, I have high estimation for all the folks who do these uh, different studies. <laughs>